Good afternoon, everybody. This is really a wonderful event. And one of the advantages of Zoom is that we were able to connect with Karen Slaughter in Georgia, our host, and Ursa, whose last name I'm going to let her pronounce herself because I will clearly stumble over it, who is somewhere in Iceland, a wonderful country which Karen and I have both visited, but apparently different seasons I've just learned from our conversation. And I'm at home in Scottsdale and Patrick is down at the Poison Pen. So you have to love the way we can actually do this. So Ursa, um, I'm going to, I don't think anybody can see it well on screen, but I am going to hold up. Is that showing? The a little bit more down, a little bit more oh, down. Oh, there, there he is. is. There you go. Okay. So uh, my one contribution to this conversation in terms of Iceland, because I've been there several times, um, my favorite part of Iceland is actually up north in Ekuveri, but um, I've been to the wonderful and famous spa near Reykjavik, which it turns out, I have to say, big disappointment here. It's not actually hot springs. It's heated by the local, what is it? The local gas plant or refinery, isn't it, Ursa? No, 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 yeah, no, no, it's Steam a plant. geothermal power plant, so, so it's heated with geothermal water, the excess water that the plant doesn't use, because you only use the steam to make the electricity, and the rest is being used, so it's kind of like cascaded use, so it's the best use of the resource ever imaginable. And you're welcome, because the Marshall Plan financed it, yeah, so we're, we're so happy to invest in your infrastructure. Maybe we should do that here. I don't know. Yeah. Crazy. What an idea. Well, anyway, the Blue Lagoon is not only notable for the wonderful water and, um, and the fact that you can take alcohol, alcoholic beverages into it if you wish to, but the most advanced technology for a locker room I have ever been <laughs> You have to really be good in order to navigate getting your locker with all the electronics and so forth, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I've been to Istifuder and Sigisfuder and, um, and Heme and the puffin picture this is my favorite story in Iceland. My younger daughter and I were on a cruise, on a big cruise ship. The weather was absolutely terrible, but we were supposed to be able to land on the island along the southern shore of Iceland, of Heme. And it was touch and go, and the captain went back and forth with headquarters in Seattle or whatever. And finally, he slid this huge ship into this little tiny opening. And then the question was, could we ever get out? So while they were debating that the next day, we had arranged to go on shore because my daughter had taken this whole trip to photograph puffins. That was, that was her raison d'etre for like 30 days on this ship and going around Iceland. She was sinking into despair. And I said to her, if we just get off the ship at two o'clock when we're supposed to, regardless of whether they're leaving or not, they can't leave us on shore and they probably can't find us. So we'll go looking for puffins, which is not really the right attitude for a cruise passenger, but hey, anyway. Um, we did get off and the captain did wait and we went off on our puffin adventure and the weather was appalling. It was sheeting with rain and sleet. It was absolutely awful, no visibility. And we trotted up to a hide on top of a cliff. And I was so grateful and I went indoors and I turned around and Susan had disappeared. And I thought, oh my God, what has happened? And somebody said, well, she went over the cliff. So my heart stopped and I thought, how am I ever going to go home and explain to my husband, her husband, that I have lost my adult daughter like you do a baby in a bathtub when you take your eye off it? She's drowned in Iceland. What will I do? But eventually she came back over the cliff with this sensational picture of the puffin and she's won a number of contests for it. So, and then the captain was able to somehow maneuver his way back out of MA and carry on to Reykjavik. So... Lots of excitement in Iceland. Ursa, tell us how to pronounce your name. Ursa Sigurðardóttir. Gesundheit. Yes. <laughs> but Ursa, aren't you the only one in Iceland with that name? It's just there you? Not, there are not many. Uh, yeah, there's, I'm the only Ursa Sigurðardóttir. But there are not many people or not women called Ursa. No. I don't know if we're, I don't know, 10 max. And a lot of those are related in some way to me, so. Wait, so you could kill them and you'd be the only one. I know, I need to work on that. <laughs> so could I ask, am I not right in thinking that in Iceland, you take your patronymic from your, your father's, is it your father's yes. name? Because it yeah. really means daughter of Sigurd, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can also use your mother's name. You can also use them both, but that means a really long name. So I would be Issa Kristinar Og Sigurðar dóttir. My last name would, you know, I wouldn't be able to fill out any forms anywhere in the world. 
Okay. I'm glad that's your worry. That's your one worry. <laughs> that's my one worry. Forms. Yeah. You can tell you work in, uh, in a, a large corporation. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to pop in real quick and just uh, let the Facebook uh, viewers know that um, I'll be monitoring the Facebook feed. So if you have questions for Ursa or Karen, go ahead and put them in, in the comments field and I'll pop up towards the end of the program. You disappeared, Patrick. We can't even hear you. You were muted. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, um, uh, but I know I just wanted to add it's a real treat to have you Ursa um, we hope to have you here and out in the desert soon and with that yeah. disappear into the darkness <laughs> yeah. we have been lucky enough to have Ragnar Janusson here um, not for a formal book event he was in Scottsdale with his family on vacation but we've zoomed with him a couple of times but Karen, um, you must have met Urza when, did you go to the Iceland Noir or the name of the, it's a November conference, right? No, oh, hell no. no? Why would you go to Iceland in November? Um, no, I met her in Norway, uh, in Oslo for a crime festival there at Easter, which is a more sensible time to be in that area. And I did a panel with you. And I remember, you know, normally, if you're an author on a panel, you're just kind of like, um, while there are other authors speaking, you're, you're in your head going, midnight at the oasis, you know, or just like, because they're going to say the same thing, you know, because authors are kind of boring. But then I was like, what? A vacuum up someone's ass? Wait a minute. Put the camels to bed. Let me listen to this lady. And she was talking, and I love science. I'm, I'm a Twitter scientist. I graduated from Twitterversity, so I know a lot about science. Um, I gave it up when I, it became time to become a constitutional law scholar during the election. Um, that, that was a, hours of my time to become uh, conversant with that. But at the time, I was very much a scientist. Um, and she was explaining the scientific... Uh, uh, link she went to to investigate how to kill someone because unfortunately Iceland doesn't have a lot of automatic weapons and things like that like we do so she has to find new ways to kill people and she's like vacuum up the asshole so <laughs> take, take it from there Ersa explain to us how this happened but but do you remember I remember you told me when you were in Iceland Karen that you worked in a power plant making the you were designing the um uh, Oh, the yeah. yeah. Well, that, so yeah. I had a sign company and there was a nuclear, there is a nuclear power plant because once you put one up, you just can't get rid of it. And um, the, it was, the technology was so old that uh, like it was before I was born, this thing was made that we had to make these custom signs for the panels that controlled everything. And it looked like the robot's chest on the original Lost in Space. So it was like, when I saw that, I was just shocked because I, you know, you have in your head, it's, it's nuclear power, right? It's Chernobyl stuff, yeah. right? And it looked just like something I would have come up with if you told me to draw a nuclear power plant. So yeah, you don't expect to see a Frankenstein switch. <laughs> exactly. Oh, like at your power plant. That was pretty yeah. interesting. It was just this big switch. <laughs> Because you work at the actual place Barbara was talking about, right? Or you well, work for that company? Yeah, I work for a company that does a lot of the design for the geothermal plants, yeah. So we got a back a behind the scenes tour, um, got to wear the, the jackets and all that and the hat, um, which I thought we looked really sexy in. I mean, it was Super. just like, wow, Super. we could be yeah. like Icelandic High calendar material, yeah. yeah. High visibility, that's the color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you explained to me that um, like a lot of people when they're driving, they hit the ga um, the, the steam pipes um, and then yeah, they well, have to be zigzaggy yeah. because of all the earthquakes. Yeah, yeah. And Take I was like, why do you live there? Why do you live there? Well, it's fabulous. Yeah, it is it's fabulous. fabulous. And we're lucky to have all that, uh, the geothermal because that makes Iceland habitable in a way because heating is cheap and, and so on. Electricity is all green. 99.999, I think, green. Well, it is a beautiful country, but let's go back to the vacuum uh, up the asshole. So how did <laughs> yeah. you come up with that? 
It was actually down the windpipe, but yeah, it's you could have. Well, no, you considered the asshole as well. <laughs> Not really, but uh, next next book. Then we have half a page of a new book. Who knows what? <laughs> yeah. The sequel. So yeah, how did you come up with that? It was just I was thinking like, what does it take to die? I mean, to kill someone, uh, and, there, and there weren't that many. I mean, you die for only a specific amount of reasons, one of them being that you don't get oxygen or, or air. And, uh, and so I came up with that to vacuum all the air out of the lungs to, to kill you quick. And, and yeah. You That's mean, not me, just a general you. Yeah, just a general you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you also came from writing children's books. Is that why you wanted to start killing people? Well, it was, it was, uh, I like to read murder mysteries. I'm a great fan of yours, you know that. Uh, so, so it was just obvious when I moved from writing for children to writing for grownups that I would write uh, murder mysteries and they would, they become more gruesome as the more I write, I think. When you look into the abyss and all that, you know, you become more creepy. And so I like creepy and, and, and uh, yeah. So, but I actually, last year, I also, I wrote two books. Also, I started writing children's books again. So I wrote one, one um, sort of a horror novel and one children's book. And I'm going to try to keep that pace, two books a year. Really? That's yeah. not, I guess, uh, since you can only go outside like three months out of the year anyway. Exactly. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. You can't travel. What's yeah. the, your COVID situation there is amazing. You told me um, last week there was like one case. I mean, there hasn't been, I think in the last week, if I, maybe one, and that was somebody in quarantine. So we wow. really haven't had any COVID to speak of since January, but it's easy. We're an island with not much, you know, and the borders are kind of restrictive now. So, so it's not, it's not all that spectacular in a way. It would be spectacularly bad if we lost control of it. That would be yeah, well, we've uh, what we've got the first time since World War II that our life expectancy has been cut by a year here in America. Really? Yes. And one person at the height of it after the Christmas and New Year's fallout, uh, one person every 28 seconds was dying in the United States. So, wow, pretty horrifying. I mean, it's just a hard number to even grapple with. More than your population, you're like 300,000. Yeah. yeah, three three fifty something like that. Yeah. Right, so uh, we're at half a million now, um, yeah, yeah. which is the population of the Atlanta city center. So it's just, That's it's horrible. such a number you can't even really comprehend it. No. That's so okay. are you, are you going to incorporate this all, at all into your next book or? No, I don't think so. Did you do, did you use it for the one you just I did, made? yeah, yeah. Really? Well, I didn't write a, a about COVID is the center, but everybody is still in the pandemic. So they're wearing masks and, you know, it just seemed yeah. like a really good way to talk about how weird our lives are. Like walking yeah. into a building and you get your temperature taken or using, you know, in Atlanta, all the distilleries started making hand sanitizer. So it sounds like, smells like schnapps or yeah. tequila. Yeah. So it's like you walk into a public space, it smells like the prom, you yeah. know, it's, it's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> And think, you know, just things like, you know, people, their eyes are getting dry from wearing masks all day. Yeah. So, you know, stuff like that, I thought this will be interesting to incorporate into a novel. And also yeah. I have a woman who's uh, has a child and the child isn't living with her, which in any other novel, people would hate that woman, but yeah. she's doing it because he's, she, the kid's living with the father because of COVID. So it's oh, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. a good excuse to get yeah. rid of kids. Because I hate writing about kids. I hate children. They're so annoying. Okay. Um, and, you know, you, you can't really kill them that much. I mean, you can kill a few, but it has to be like really yeah. Yeah. emotional, right? Yeah. 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 It's not like with Barbara where it's like, wow, what am I going to tell her husband? It's like, no, I'm really going to miss this person. Yeah. <laughs> is that a Will Trent novel, Karen, or is it a standalone? It's a standalone. It's called False Witness. Um, it's got lawyers in it. Um, I love it. I, I know that oh, sounds like really yeah. shitty to say. I really love it because I just delivered it. Yeah. <laughs> but right. what's a, what is it like for you to, you know, write in this kind of environment? Are you feeling more pressure or? 
last year I well the book I wrote last year I felt uh, very very uninspired to begin with mm -hmm. I just felt you know everybody was you, there wasn't like a, a lockdown but nobody went anywhere everything was closed and and it just I don't know I was just really uninspired but then I I somehow managed to 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 get back on track but now it's fine I mean really it doesn't change all that much for me in a way I'm not downtown clubbing or you know I don't go a lot to the theater or I don't really do very much so so yeah I got back on track it was just some sort of weird feeling of everything changing somehow without anybody having given permission that it should change right. well I've noticed uh, the only part I've noticed is travel my yeah. life at home I, we're, I'm very fortunate because I love staying at home yeah and I don't like you know normally this time of year when I finish a book I get a nice pair of shoes to wear when I start touring and I was like yeah. do people even wear shoes anymore yeah <laughs> no. you know I just had to think about it yeah. like, what are people doing I mean but I know I'm very lucky because there's a lot of people who don't have a choice right and yeah. Yeah. they're out there in the middle of it but you know I think everybody's kind of had this postponement or suspension of grief yeah. about what's going on and you know you and I both write about trauma and you as a legitimate scientist, as opposed to a Twitter scientist, you know, you understand the, what's involved with trauma and how, you know, later in life it can lead to heart disease and it can lead to cancers and, you know, uh, uh, to be more open to drug dependency and suicide yeah. and all these horrible things. And we're all experiencing it at the same time. I mean, do you feel, I, I think that a lot of people just in general in Iceland are sort of like, um, very even keeled anyway but do you think that you're going to um, see that i think i think it's going to be really i think it's really been tough on the young like the, the the kids in high school the university students because a lot of a big part of that experience is also the socializing mm -hmm. and that's just been taken away completely you know the, the, they need to go out and get drunk or not drunk whatever they you know just meet people and, and that has just totally disappeared. And I think that is going to, to take some time to, yeah, uh, to, to work, it, work itself out in a way. And I'm sure that we'll have fewer new couples because I don't know where they would meet or maybe they don't meet anymore. Maybe it's all on Tinder. I don't know. I'm, I'm another generation. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we'll have even more because they're all on Tinder. I don't know. But I, but I do think it's not good. And for kids, you know, that they're, they were supposed to pick two kids to play with or something. And, and that's, that I found the most abhorrent way of, of, of solving the situation because what about the kid that nobody picks? Yeah. You know, that, that was just like, yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a weird situation. And I think the economy also, that's had a really bad effect because a lot, a big part of our economy is the tourism. Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be a lot of negative uh, there's a huge impact on, on those that were employed in, in tourism. And, and, and it said Iceland doesn't know, we, we, we don't know how to deal with unemployment because usually we don't have unemployment. So, so it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be an easy climb up, I think. Hopefully, though. I've always felt that the world was divided into people who read and people who don't. But people who don't read are always looking for alternate forms of entertainment. The Wall Street Journal had the most amazing article today about the absolute boom in miniature kits. And there's some woman who spent 12 hours tufting a miniature chair. And Dana Sabinar, who's staying with us right now but going home soon, you know, we both looked at each other incredulously and said, who has time to spend 12 hours tufting a chair? when in fact they could be reading a book. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I do think Iceland, if I remember this right, has one of the world's highest literacy rates, um, you know, tremendous uh, literacy rate. Um, very, I think everybody has learned English so you can read, you know, widely. And of course you've got your own history of the sagas and so forth. So, you know, do you feel like people have taken more to reading or because it was so high, has it been more or less the same? I think it's there's been more reading for sure, for sure. Uh, the government also stepped in to help publishers because at the beginning of the the uh, 
of the pandemic, they, they thought publishers would be hard hit with closing of bookshops and things. So and that uh, helped. So, so a lot of publishers were able to publish more books than they would usually do. I think they get paid back from the tax 25% of every penny they spend on salaries or ads or whatever they, they do, printing and, and things. Um, so that just having more books made people read more. But regarding literacy, I'm not sure we have the, we do have a very high literacy rate, but the, there's a disturbing, uh, they keep saying that the literacy rate for boys is going down. My take on that is, I don't think the literacy of boys is going down. I think they're just testing them in the wrong language. If they were reading, they would test them in English, they'd do fine because the boys are so good at English because of computer games and things. So, so I, I think, I think the literacy rate is higher when in the case of boys than, than what they're saying. So you're, you're saying basically you think boys are more proficient reading English than they are Icelandic? Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Wow. I think it's because, well, yeah. yeah. It makes sense. Our boys here are more proficient playing games than they are speaking English. So it's the same <laughs> thing. Yeah. 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 Right, but you know, Karen mentioned an even keel, and it just you know occurs to me that in a country that you know has a high percentage of readers, it may help um, ward off. I mean, I'll, I I feel like I'm living in a dystopian novel, which is not my favorite genre to begin with. So I've avoided it, you know, reading, and now here I am living in it, and I think, hmm. Um, so one of the things that's been increasingly popular are audio books mm -hmm. as well. There was a Huge company number. that came here from Sweden, and and I, I I don't I don't myself I don't listen to audiobooks, and I can't even read books in an e-reader. I have to have a book in my hand, so I don't get the appeal. Uh, if I listen to something, it would be a podcast or, or something, but not a book. I, I have to read it. I have to have it in my hand, and I hope that and I, and I think it will remain. Uh, I mean, at least here in Iceland, people enjoy having holding a book getting the feel of it, the smell of it, the, 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 it's an experience. It's not just the data going into your head. You know, it's, it's more than that, I think. Well, you retain it better and the, there's a sort of dimensionality to the printed word. That, so yeah. you retain it better. But I like, I like audiobooks for long trips and things. Um, yeah. But I guess you can't go anywhere, so. Well, <laughs> there are no long distances here. <laughs> That's right, we'll go to the fjord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> story time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's uh what's happening in the old Reykjavik? Uh, anything going on there? Are you into anything or Netflix and chill? I guess you're always chill, but I'm always chill. Yeah, uh, I, Netflix is. I I saw that your book is coming. Netflix is making pieces of her. Is it? Yeah, awesome? yeah. It's very exciting. Wow! Congratulations. That's fantastic. Yeah, I can't even go. It's being filmed in Australia, which is weird because uh, I just got this note on my mailbox that Stranger Things is filming in my neighborhood. It's like, so oh, <laughs> your book is <laughs> yeah, pieces of her in yeah. Australia. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, it's super exciting. Oh, Have you oh. had anything ad adapted yet of your work? Yeah. Or? There's one movie that's been made. Uh, I Remember You, the ghost novel was made into a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What did that feel like? Were you happy with it? I was really happy with it, yeah. I was not involved at all. I chose not to be. And I, and I think that was the right decision I don't, mm -hmm. for me. I, I'm sure there, uh, were, are you involved in any of it? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I'm a, I'm a producer, so they consult me, but then it's like five other producers and they're like, yeah, we're gonna do this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, they've been great. It hasn't yeah. been painful at all. I've heard like terrible stories about people. And, you know, I think the thing you have to do, and probably you did this was say, I wrote the book and I'm giving you the, the um, option to interpret it. Right. Yeah. Cause you can't just have a, a lot of that book is very insular and you can't have two episodes of a girl just driving and crying. You know, yeah. it would be uh, maybe a French movie, right? Yeah. It would work. Uh, and then in the last five minutes, they would explain what it was about and show a picture yeah. of a turtle. Um, yeah. But so, it, it, you know, I know they have to change stuff. It's been really interesting to see the process just as something different. 
Yeah. And it's also kind of flattering, right? Because this thing you write in your pajamas that no one really knows about, and suddenly hundreds of people are working on it. And I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. I yeah. can't wait to see it. Me my too. Take, my take was, and it's also because it's such a different medium, like a, a book and a, and a film, for example, or a TV show, they, there's lot, lots less space in a way. And I decided to look at it that, okay, this book, if you take the corny thing, like the book is my child, the movie is my grandchild. And it's not appropriate for me as the grandmother to be involved in the inception of the grandchild. Yeah, that would be incest. Yeah. That would be incest or yeah, or voyeurism, like weird, yeah. weird voyeurism, yeah. 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 So, so that's not what I did, but and it's just a different craft than, and I, I, I I think I did the, the right thing. And they, they made changes that I would never have come up with or, or uh, and I would have thought probably it was a really bad idea that turned out to be really good in the end for the yeah. movie. Yeah. It's surprising. It's for very those, surprising. For those who don't know your work, could you tell us, um, you have two series, if I remember right. One yes. is um, with Thora, and then recently you've written three books in a different one. So you want to just tell us a little bit about it for those who don't haven't had a chance to discover you yet? Yeah, the, I, I wrote a series originally about a lawyer named Thora. Um, and they're not courtroom dramas. It, it's more, uh, she's dealing with cases where she has to go look into to what's really going on. Um, and then I've written some standalones and the movie was made from one of those. Uh, those tend to be a little bit more into horror. I love horror. Um, and so, so the movie is from a book called I Remember You. That's a ghost story, where it combines like a ghost story and a crime. It's, 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 uh, yeah, it's, it's good. I promise. It's not a creepy, stupid ghost story. I mean, it's creepy, but it's not a stupid ghost story. It's good. And then uh, right. I wrote another series about a, a policeman and a child psychologist. And now I'm embarking on a yet another series with half a page done already. So. So are you a believer that series have a natural end life or, or that you get a new story idea that doesn't fit the characters you've already created? Yeah, well, I think, I think there are two different, I mean, there are two different types of main protagonists, probably more, but like the two big general groups would be the character that doesn't change very much and then the characters that evolve. One is not better than the other in any way. Uh, they're just different. And I think if you're writing about a character that doesn't change and evolve, it's easier to write endless stories. But the characters that change and evolve, you get just, there comes a point where you, <clears throat> you think their story is somehow over because the books are also a little bit about their story. And, and so I find I've been able, my, my first series was six books. The second was six books. I think six books is good for me, but there are other people who can write many, many uh, uh, books in a series and, and remain fantastically good and, and, and interesting. But I find if I'm not super interested anymore, I, I, the book is not going to be good. But like I said, I'm not saying it's like Poirot doesn't change very much. Fantastic series. J Jack Reacher doesn't change much. Fantastic series. So it's not I'm not at all uh, saying that one is better than the other by no by no means. No, what you're saying is that your involvement or your enthusiasm is really what determines, you know, when it's time to yeah. move on to something else. Yeah, and I think if I was writing about a character that was always the same, it would be easier to keep the enthusiasm going because I could focus more on the crime at hand and not have to think as much about the, the development in the character's life. I've always thought, Karen, maybe you agree with me or don't, that one of the, one of the real keys to the Reacher series longevity is he doesn't have to drag a whole big cast with him because mm -hmm. he's, he's always new in a new place that he lands with a few yeah. exceptions. I mean, there've been, you know, some hangovers from his military career and other stuff, but mostly it's like a complete reset. Um, yeah. Do you find Karen, you know, when you're writing that bringing in the subsidiary characters um, is, you know, what is it more work, less work, a joy, something of a drag sometimes? Well, you know, it depends because, um, you know, the thing is, you've got to know the secrets about the character that make them interesting to you. And I think my, what I would say is 
kind of what Irsa is saying is like, when you don't know any more secrets, that's the natural end of this character. Um, my, my fail safe is to just really make them as fucked up as possible, right? There's like, oh my God, this guy, he's got so much baggage, but then you get to roll it out. And the trick is when you bring in other characters is in a series, especially, you got to know how much information to give about that character. And what's important to this book may not be what was important to the previous book. So, you know, Will has a, a disability and sometimes that's a plot point or it's a turning point in the story. And other times I don't even mention it because it just doesn't matter to, as much to that story as it would before. And, and that's what I think is fun. I mean, we we're talking a little bit about predatory habits earlier because I'm also a kitten behaviorist. Uh, and I was talking about my cat Dexter is an ambush predator. And I'm definitely like, I'm the youngest of uh, three girls. So I had to be the ambush predator, you know? Uh, and I think that knowing all these secrets about these characters gives me that ability to just like jump out and, and put it in where it needs to go. Uh, and I really, that's the part I love is saying something new about this character or, I mean, Irsa, maybe you've experienced this as you've gotten older. There's like, you know, when you're 20, you're like, oh, I want people to love me. I want to please everybody. And by the time you're 50, you're like, fuck it, man. I don't care, oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so there's a new story to tell. Obviously, I'm not going to make Sarah my age because she's been through too much already. Uh, but there's like a new story to tell, especially if women's stories as they get older, I feel like, because they're just your attitude towards the world at large changes. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. It's not just your attitude, your body changes too. Um, Thanks a lot, Barbara. Well, I'm, what are you saying? I um, let's get thinner. I, what I, the I, hell? Sorry, I'm speaking from real experience. I've been so pissed that, you know, the other night I apparently jammed my finger and I woke up and I thought, why is my hand hurt? Which would never have happened 30 years ago. Or, you know, I got sciatica at Canyon Ranch doing something. I don't know what. And I thought, there we go again. Um, so, you know, the confidence that you have in your body, the physical body, when you're 20, when you think you're indestructible and rarely do things hurt. I mean, for most of us, if we're lucky and we feel kind of indestructible, that really changes. Childhood yeah. changes you. If you have children, you know, your body is never the same after, yeah. you know, after pregnancy. And so I think, I think, you know, that has a lot, women's bodies change more than men's bodies over time and so i think well, that has a lot yeah to you've seen both you've seen both happen um i i think it's a certain age you're like it's no longer a scar it's going to be an identifying mark yeah right but yeah. yeah i mean when i was 12 i could stab myself and sleep it off and now if i sit too long with my legs crossed right. i'm gonna have trouble getting up <laughs> You know, getting in and out of the car can really, you know, if your back hurts, you, know, you have to decide which leg to take off the ground first. <laughs> what what yeah. is the, uh, the Curtis yeah. Sittenfeld book about uh, aging? Slightly racist, but she just, uh, she, it, it, I think it came out last year where she was talking about aging and I really keyed into it in a way I never would have five years ago. It was sort of like this canary in the coal mine moment. Like, wow, that's going to happen to my knees. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. The more you run, the bigger chance you've got and so forth. But there we are. Well, we're off topic. Um, so Ursa, um, what would you like to tell us about Iceland that we haven't talked about? It's such a wonderful country. And I've loved visiting it all the times that I have. The, the only thing is that I've always visited it by sailing around it rather than driving it. Isn't there some wonderful like coastal drive you can do oh, yeah, around yeah. summer yeah. all? Yeah, there's a, the ring road kind of. Right. The, it's, it's quite popular to do the whole country. Some people take campers or, or you can just rent a car and stay in hotels. It's, it's uh, the landscape is so beautiful and so different between sort of the regions. So you can see uh, the good thing about Iceland is that you're, there are lots and lots and lots of beautiful, beautiful nature in the States, obviously, but you have to go a very long distance to see something very different. You know, if you, if you want to see, for example, something in Arizona, 
totally different landscape than what you, you would have up in Vermont or somewhere, but the distances are so huge. Whereas in Iceland, you are never, you know, I mean, you, you're never more than 20 minutes away from basically pristine nature. That is That's changing. Well. I know that they trained astronauts in the interior, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Course, but I've always thought one of the most interesting things to do, and Karen, maybe you did it too, was there's that chasm where you can stand it's with so one friend. Yeah, yeah. Well, one leg in the, you know, one half of the world and one leg in the other, those two plates that meet uh -huh. in Iceland. Yeah. But, you know, that's an experience you really can't have anywhere else. I think it's- no. I went snorkeling in it, like in uh, two degree temperature. I was snorkeling between those. I was touching North America and Europe. Uh, I think, I couldn't feel my hands. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those things I was, we're telling uh, Irsa at dinner, she was like, what are you going to do? And we told her, and she's like, that is insane. Why would <laughs> anybody do that and pay money? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was, it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. It, it was so cool though. Uh, and so clear and beautiful and um, absolutely insane though. If it was colder standing, waiting to get into it because of the wind. Oh. And I literally got blown into a fence. Um, so that was fantastic. Yeah, I had like a fence mark on my hip for the rest of the trip. So you've gone in winter, whereas I've done all my traveling in Iceland. Yeah, you, in you've been smarter. You've been much smarter. So let me ask you one more thing before we invite Patrick in. Um, so what is the um, Icelandic Crime Festival? I think it's in November. Yes, it's in November, around the 20th of November called Iceland Noir and it's held every every second year. It was supposed to be last year, but we had to cancel because of uh, COVID. Uh, we do think that we will be holding it this year. We are, are I mean, if vaccinations go the way they are or seem to be going, then I don't see that there should be a reason why we wouldn't. So that might be the only, and it's also late November, so, so I mean, obviously we won't hold it if, if, there, if the pandemic is still going strong, but, but it does appear now, if everything goes the way it's planned, then we will be holding it again in November. Is that a great time for Northern Lights viewing? Yeah, it is, it is, yeah. Well, I have to say I'm truly tempted, if not this November, then next November, I would really love yeah. to go because the Northern Lights are not quite as spectacular when I have been there in the summer. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, they're there, but you just can't see them because it's bright. Right. Yeah, and but and I'm, a fantastic, and I'm a fantastic Northern Lights spotter for people. Oh, good. So, because I'm always outside smoking, so I will see them when they arrive. All right. <laughs> you know. so, so, Patrick, you want to come back in for your black hole and tell us if we have any questions to answer? Sure. Um, well, for one thing, it's, it's, it's great because there are people literally watching from all over the world. I have Belgium, Switzerland, uh, Australia, all kinds of places. Um, let's see. Yes, I have a, a question from um, Teresa. She, and this is for, for Karen and Ursa. It says, uh, I'm working on a protagonist whose background is a pararescue officer. I'm now concerned that my lack of experience with knowing the military world will cause problems with authenticity. What is your advice? Oh. Don't do it, no. I'm if, I, if I go first, uh, I would say, just speak to someone who has that uh, experience because no, no crime writer has experienced everything that all the characters go through. You just have to, you know, go find somebody that's willing to talk to you and. And, and it'll often, often speaking to people also, I mean, a lot of information you can get on the internet, but speaking to someone who's actually been in a position will, will somehow reveal things that you would never even think to ask. So I would, I would um, yeah, urge you to find someone who, who has this experience and sort of, yeah, take them in for a, like a deep interrogation. Yeah, I mean, we've never murdered anybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, not that you admit to. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, Barbara, there was that one time you pushed your daughter over a cliff, but she gave, yeah. she gave back. 
No kidding. I have to say, you know, you always read these terrible stories about mothers who turn their backs on their children, you know, drowned in the bathtub. I honestly thought that, you know, here I was at age 70 something um, about to experience that with my adult daughter. I was really stricken. Oh, um, no, um, I don't actually read all those stories, Barbara. It seems like you seek them out. <laughs> Well, I have to say traveling, you know, one of the best things about traveling is all the stuff you don't expect to happen. I mean, you know, it used to be, I can say this, way more spontaneous. You know, you would show up on a ship and then you could pick what you wanted to do. You could arrive in a country and you could decide where to go or pick a restaurant or something. And now everybody plans and books everything ahead. So it's really killed off an enormous amount of spontaneity, I find. Um, yeah with traveling. Also COVID. Cruise well, ship. No, I'm talking about before COVID. When I was a child, my father did a lot of business traveling and he would take us on these wonderful safaris all around the United States. I mean, I made loops from Chicago up into Canada, down to California and, you know, back and so forth. But he always had this really rigid schedule and it used to drive me crazy because, you know, you would see something you really wanted to go do and then there wasn't anywhere or time to do it. And I find myself now in the last, you know, right before COVID and I stopped traveling, I found myself really pushing against this necessity to have booked everything way in advance. I just, you know, I, I think the experiences that you gain from traveling are the ones you don't expect are often more rewarding than the ones that you actually planned on doing before you left home. Just me, whoops, sorry. So um, Patrick, carry on while I try to turn my phone off. Spontaneity has its time and place, right? <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Here's a good one from Teresa. Again, this is for Karen. She says, will you bring Callie Zanger from the Silent, Silent Wife into another story? I thought her a fantastic character. Very fucked up. I like her style. Um, thank you. Yeah, she was really fucked up. I feel like, you know, if, the, if a murder needed to go down, she'd be the, your go-to. Um, and I really liked her name. You know that Irsa, maybe you maybe this isn't a problem for you because every character has a very unpronounceable name. <laughs> um, but you know, I always think if if you need this character, um, I'm saying I think this is Teresa Singer. So um, if you need a character to like stick in someone's head, then you give them an unusual name. You know, you can't just have John Smith and Joe Smith, and you know, you, so I try. I work really hard on the names to make sure. If it's an important character, you need to remember they have that. But she, yeah, she'd be a lot of fun. I mean, I wouldn't want her um, like on a if you needed some subtlety because she's more burn the motherfucker down, which I actually am that way too. And if you get two uh, of those personality types together, it's just really bad. Okay, I have a, a question from. Um, I'm sorry, Peggy, I can't pronounce your name, um, but you're from. She's from Belgium. I could give it, no, I'm not gonna even gonna give it a try. Uh, let's see. She says, uh, I, I've already visited Iceland five times and I still will come back. I was uh, lucky enough to meet Yersa once in Antwerp and Karen already two times in Antwerp and once in Brussels. And this is interesting. Um, if I can, here we go. Yeah, uh, what I like very much is the Icelandic tradition and Yersa, you're gonna have to help me out here. Uh, Maybe I should spell it. Yola, Yola Boca Flode. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, nice. Together with our best friends, we now also celebrate this in Belgium. Does Karen know this tradition? In which book uh, did Irsa receive last Yoka Flode? Yola Boca <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know, but I have a feeling it's like a lot of alcohol is involved, just what <laughs> no. I know of Iceland. No? So fermented fish no it's uh it's a, a tradition here to give people books for christmas and it's called the christmas book flood so so you give people the christmas general christmas present is a book and and it's uh and it's a really nice gift because you need to put a lot of thought into selecting the book for the person like you have to know the person a little bit like what do they want to read and so on and uh, and then when we meet for Christmas parties after meet family, everybody's discussing what book they got, you know, how do they like this book, that book, and so on. 
For Christmas, I got uh, one by Olafur Johan Olafsson. Uh, I got Ragnar Jonasson and Eva. She's a new uh, newcomer into the English market, at least. And but she's Icelandic. Uh, Eva Björk. So I had three three books. So and it's a fa I mean, every country should have this seriously. And then Probably have the books. holidays reading. It's good when the weather is cold outside and awful and you don't have to go to work, you know, it's Christmas holidays, then you can spend that time reading good books. Barbara, are you taking notes here? We got it. We got it. We got to do this in the summertime. Yeah. It would be a good idea. Great. You know what? I want to give a shout out to wherever it is from Antwerp because Antwerp turned into one of my favorite cities when we visited it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised at a book question because Antwerp has the cool, one of the oldest public, maybe the oldest publishing house in the world and one of the truly great museums. I mean, this is a museum, it's like three old townhouses where you can get lost for an entire day and go through the whole history of book publishing and manufacturing and rare books. And not to mention it has one of the world's most fabulous train stations. So mm -hmm. I love Antwerp and, but it's-, it's and, and the book fair, there's a fantastic book fair there. Sure. Then I, I didn't, I missed the book fair. I was there for yeah. other purposes. I was actually there after visiting the tulips in Holland, which is yeah. one of the, you know, it was on my list of things I most wanted to do was to see the gardens in Holland when the tubes, but we, we went to Antwerp and I thought that was, that was again, one of those bonuses that I didn't expect when I started the trip, but it turned out that Antwerp was just absolutely knockout. So thanks for watching us from Antwerp. Love to come back and see you. Anything else there, Patrick? Yeah, uh, Susie uh, says, uh, let's see, hello from Scotland. A question for both of you. Are you plotters or pantsers when you write your novels? Um, I guess that's it. Karen, you Me? Um, well, I usually wear shorts because um, <laughs> I have fantastic legs. Uh, you know, and, and Marissa, maybe, because we're both scientists, one of us actually a, a real one. Um, I always look at a book in sections, you know, I don't really outline, but I think about the beats because there's there's two ways a book works. One is the plot, the who done it, and the other is what's it going to do to the characters. And so that's what I really think about when I think about a book is, you know, where are the where are the emotional moments? Where are the, oh crap, I didn't know that was gonna happen moments. That, that's what I normally contemplate when I'm thinking about writing a new story. Cause I'm actually in the middle of that cause I'm thinking about my next uh, novel which is a Will Trent book. And I'm trying to figure out where to enter the story. You know, at what point that's a really important thing. It's like, you know, is it the day this happens or Where's everybody gonna be when this happens? Um, and then once I get into it, I'm more um, seat of your shorts about, you know, well, there was there an accomplice or things like that? Because you have to really, for me, know a couple of things before you even start writing. And the big one for me is you gotta know who did it uh, and you gotta know why. Because otherwise, for me, I can't do any of the misdirect or the red herrings or anything like that unless I'm very clear about where it's going to end up. Yeah, I, I, I just second that. I have to know who did it and why they did it, and and but how exactly you go from point A in the beginning to to the end that tends to change a little bit, but. But I could never sit down and start writing a book without having no clue who are the characters and, and, and so on. What am I doing here? That would not work for me. So there's a lot of thinking prior to. I don't, like, I'm looking at your board there that you said was 100 years old or something with the, with the notes on it. I always think, like, oh, it'd be so nice to have, like, strings attaching things and clues and but uh, and I bought a board, but I, I never even put it up. So it's all yeah. In my this was like I got to put some shit on here because people are going <laughs> to see it, right? I mean, there's literally like milk written. Up <laughs> yeah, there. grocery lists. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I have a couple of people. This is for Irsa asking about: Will there be any more uh, Thora books? Yeah. No. 
no, I, I don't think so. Uh, I sort of, no, I, I don't think so. I, I, I wish I could say yes, but, but I can't somehow see myself somehow revisiting that story. I but think, it was, I think oh. it's perfect what you did though. I mean, I love those books. So I think uh, like maybe you could kill her and then everybody else could investigate it. Yeah, and I could have a new team come in. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> But it's just, there are some things, I don't know, that you just put behind you and, and, and it would be really hard to come back after all these years to, to, to do it again. I, I, I would probably, I probably lost her essence somehow from my brain. It's been purged through, through the other books. So, so unfortunately, no. Here's a question, uh, Anne from Scotland. She says, uh, book festivals have been held digitally this year or virtually. Uh, do you think this may happen more or a combination reaching global audiences? Uh, and she says, thank you, Ersa, for visiting Bloody Scotland Book Festival. That's a fantastic one. Yeah. Bloody Scotland is fantastic. For everybody, anybody who's, who's uh, thinking of what festival should I go to, Bloody, uh, Bloody Scotland is fantastic. Uh, now I forgot the question because I was thinking about how fantastic Bloody Scotland is. Was it fantastic though? Oh, it was fantastic, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, right. think if, I think if publishers can save like 10 cents, they're going to keep doing it, right? Yeah, and it also, I think it'll be a combination probably. Yeah, I think it's going to be a combination because there's absolutely no reason because Karen, you know, because how many times you've been to the Poison Pen, we've been videoing our events and having them on Facebook for like two decades, mm -hmm. which is why really this whole COVID thing has been so easy for us as a bookstore because we were already doing all this. Um, I love the fact that we have an international audience for these conversations and, you know, they're not really generated by us per se. It's your social media Ursa, and Karen's social media and, you know, word of mouth and God knows how it all works. I've never figured it out. It's like you lob something off and, you know, it spins in all directions, but there isn't any reason why you can't have live panels and an audience mm -hmm. and also video them, video them and, and put them up in, in a way that you can have a global audience. It's really just a question of deciding what the fee structure is and the capacity. Um, for those of you who don't know, Zoom, for example, as a tool has different levels um, and they can get quite expensive. If you get up into a lot of viewers, Patrick and I were just discussing earlier, we're about to do a charity um, event on Zoom for a local scholarship fund on Saturday. And Patrick was asking me about the capacity I expected because the price of Zoom, the subscription price goes up dramatically. So as a festival organizer, you'd have to decide what your limits were. You know, how many, how many people would you expect and what, you know, how much do you want to pay for the Zoom and, and all of that. But these are all really easy questions to answer. You just need to plan in advance. And I'm all in favor of it. I mean, one of the things we've loved about, I just set up an event this morning for a debut author in Scotland and Jane Ann Krentz in Seattle, who's really taken to this. And Jane Ann did an event with me for a new British author. And I'm doing three Australians uh, on one day in March. I thought I might as well put them on top of each other. Then we could just like do a whole Australian evening, you know, whatever. Um, you just, I mean, our biggest problem is how much time do we have? I mean, Patrick and I have only so many hours, but we could literally Zoom all day, couldn't we? We could do workshops and all kinds of things. If we just had enough time, you know, from the things we've already committed to. So again, festival organizers would have to decide. Um, I think, I, all I think also, if, if I take it from the point of view of someone who organizes a festival, because me and Ragnar uh, and Lilia and, and, and Oscar, there are four of us that organize Iceland Noir. Okay. And, Sometimes, because it's always in November, we have hard time getting authors that are finishing their book at that time or, 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 or you know, because authors tend to, to, to work against the same deadline each year. And authors like you, Karen, that can't come because you're in the middle of finishing a book. Mm -hmm. And that would open up the opportunity to, to have that shown on a screen. And then you just, at your festival, authors that are not able to come because the trip is long and, and they don't have the time then you could have them at the festival on a panel, but on screen That's and right. tell Zoom. It's only gonna be the two of us because everybody's sitting in the, they're not actually on Zoom. 
Yeah, no, you can you can actually broadcast as you say. We've done events like that um, for years with one pair of authors, one of whom never comes to the store, and the other one always comes to the store until yeah. this year. And the one that never comes is on a big screen behind the one that's yeah. there. And yeah. um, you know, there there's all kinds of possibilities. Patrick, do you have a final question? We probably ought to wind this up because I find that an hour is about as long as people's attention span is good for watching a screen. I can imagine also from an author's perspective, though, that that could be a potential nightmare where, uh, you know, like carrying your schedule for like six or seven Zoom things a day. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Same problem we have. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, OK. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to do two, two short questions. Uh, one of them is for Karen. Um, uh, Teresa says, you wrote The Silent Wife in alternating present time and flashback chapters. Uh, will false witness be in a similar chronology and what are the challenges of that um you know there is a past present but it's not like the the previous book um and i kind of like that because there's nothing better in crime than sins of the past biting you in the butt today as shakespeare said um so i love that format um and I love writing about deeply, deeply damaged people. And usually that ch happens in childhood. So, you know, it's the best of both worlds because I get to write about it. But since I hate children, I don't have to write about them for very long because it's a shorter chapter. And you're just like, this bad thing happened. They're adults now, aren't they interesting? Ursa, <laughs> follow that if you can. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a question for, for Ursa. And it's, it's a really, I really like this question. Ursa, I, she, uh, Karen writes, Ursa, I really like your series about Freya and Holdar. Is that right? Um, the murders are very creepy. How creepy are you? <laughs> oh, I'm totally creepy. I'm yeah. Totally creepy. Yeah, I am. Fair, fair. <laughs> yeah, I am. And it's, uh, I, I love horror, and that tends to sort of uh, creep into the books in a way. I like creepy. I like things that go bump in the night and 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 uh and i like i mean i've done this since i was a kid i like things unsolved mysteries and anything that was <coughs> a little bit awful i liked so i'm i'm totally creepy yeah totally love you for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, well, you know, Karen, thank you for suggesting this wonderful idea. I am so grateful that you did. I've wanted to meet Ursa for years. Um, so it was terrific that you gave us the opportunity. Absolutely. To and anybody who hasn't read her books, she's a fantastic plotter, but also characters are so amazing. And if you think Iceland is like, well, that's weird. It is weird. <laughs> but, you know, it, you're, you're, she's telling, Ears is telling universal stories about really horrible things in a really interesting way. So I hope that people watching this who haven't read her will read her uh, immediately. Is there, is there a starting point? I've had a few questions, you know, asking, do I have to start at the very beginning or Irsa, do you have a, a comment about that? Does I would always matter? start at the beginning. Yeah. I would always start at the beginning because yeah, it would just, for me, it wouldn't work to start anywhere else than the beginning. And and just remembering, you can always go back. It's not as if you're writing it, you know, with a feather on, on some really expensive parchment that, so so it's, it's uh, I, I would recommend starting at the beginning. There are three Freya novels, right? So that would be easier. Um, if you didn't want to delve back too far, you could read that series in order. Yeah. Or the standalones. Oh, sorry, sorry, I sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant if you were writing a book, if you would start no, in the middle. No, no, no. If you're oh, reading, no, if you write a book, just start at I'm the sorry. end. That's the postmodern <laughs> approach, right? Yeah, right. All the way around. So, so you know what else yeah, would, be really, would really be fun if you wanted to organize some of your Icelandic colleagues who are, you know, uh, we could do a thing with several Absolutely. Icelandic authors if you'd like to put that together. Ragnar and I have and zoomed a couple of times. Yeah. So, you know, let me know if you'd like to put that together at some point, we'll do it. That sounds perfect. It would be great. So thank you both. And I wanna thank everybody who's joined us today. Um, this will become a podcast uh, tomorrow whenever my husband whose new thing is podcast. And I have to say, we talked about audiobooks for a moment. There've been over 70,000 downloads now of the podcasts that have been made from these author talks. So you can experience them that way. And they will also stay up on Facebook, our, 
Facebook page forever, and you don't have to belong to Facebook. So um, you just have to click into poisonpen.com and click on the Facebook videos, and there you are. So feel free to share these with your friends. Um, it's always great to, you know, enjoy the conversation as widely as we possibly can. Patrick, thanks as always for your terrific moderating. See you all soon. Bye. 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 Thanks. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.